Welcome to Pickup Game. And uh, I know that's a big time open right there, Frank Martin and Coach Ager, but uh, I appreciate you guys being with us. But before we start the, uh, the show, each and every week, what we've tried to do is make sure we thank the essential workers, uh, the people on the front lines, the first responders, the doctors, the nurses, the, the hospital workers, the EMTs, and anyone and everyone who's making uh, the ultimate sacrifice for the good of others. And it's a great message for everyone in terms of being selfless. Uh, we also want to make sure that we you know, recognize uh, anyone and everyone that's been impacted by any type of systemic racism. It just it breaks my heart uh, where we are in this country right now. But uh, I think that we've got to find ways and find solutions. But I also don't want to stereotype. I've never been a guy, and I, I think coaches, you, you agree with me, that stereotype or label people. And it also breaks my heart. I have two former players, one who played for me actually at the University of Miami, Eric Brown, another Keith Armstrong who played for me at Pitt, two African-American terrific people, terrific players. They're in law enforcement. And I had long talks with them the last two weeks, and it just breaks my heart to hear their stories of how many really good people in law enforcement there are, and how many people really care, and how many people are community-based, and how many people want to make a, dif a difference in communities. So, you know, I think it's important that we don't just broad base uh, stereotype and label people. They're good and bad of almost every walk in life. And, uh, you know, listening to their guys' stories, it hurts them because they're trying to do good. And there's a lot of other people that are trying to do good. So I appreciate you guys being here. And uh, when we get started, you know, the first thing is everyone's had a journey. And uh, Frank, you know, your journey's been unique, but everyone's had someone who's impacted their life. Who's had the greatest influence? Uh oh, I think we just lost Frank. Well, Coach Ager, who's had the greatest influence on your your coaching career uh, from where you were? I mean, you you were a Division two or Division three guy. To ever, if it had a BL at the end of it or a BA at the end of it, you've coached in that league. From there, you you know. Two, two different organizations, you've been an NBA head coach. Who has had a great impact on your journey? Well, a couple of people. Uh, I was very fortunate coming out of college. Uh, I got to be an assistant coach at an equivalent of a double-A baseball affiliate in the minor leagues. And uh, we had a couple tough years, and we hired uh, Dwayne Tickner, a good friend of mine. Uh, and he really showed me, you know, at age 26, uh, how, to, how to lead a team, how to lead an organization, how to be a pro, how to treat players. Uh, at an absolute high professional level. Uh, and I learned a ton from him in just that one year. And uh, and then I got to be a head coach after that and uh, really cut my teeth day in, day out. And in the minor leagues, you know, you do all the recruiting and you sign all the players and it's like your own laboratory. Um, and then you you know, go play against uh, and coach against great coaches and have that opportunity in the minor leagues. Uh, it's their invention against your invention. Uh, and you want to promote your players as much as possible to get them called up to the NBA. And uh, so at that point, a lot of the guys, uh, I would go sit at Flip Saunders practice and, you know, he, I thought as a brilliant, brilliant basketball mind. And I, I love him as a human as well. And, and we certainly all miss Flip. Um, and so he was a guy that really had an influence on, on my coaching, uh, being player friendly, communicating with players, listening, and then putting them in positions to be successful. And, uh, another one was always Rick Carlisle. I'd beg and, and get into his training camps and, uh, to watch the way that he would set a practice up. He'd do one thing, he'd do another thing, and the players are kind of going, uh, and he puts the third drill in, and then the first two make sense, and you have those aha moments that players have and teams have, and uh, I, I love that. And I, that's, I, I miss the heck out of it, Coach, uh, being out for this year and not coaching. Uh, I go down to the Turner Studios and do some TV, and they'd have to kick me out of the studios because it, we, it was the like what we're doing right now. I miss the most of like, man, I just want to hang out. The games are on. Let's talk hoop and hoop and hoop. And uh, that's that's a part of it that I miss the most for sure. Frank, you, you've had an interesting journey also. But like I would think I know who the answer to this, but who's had the greatest influence on on where you were? I mean, think about it. first generation coming over, born here in the States from an assistant coach at Miami High to the Final Four, National Coach of the Year, impacting an incredible number of lives. Who, who's been your influencer? Yeah, Shaky Rodriguez. Uh, his proper name is Marcos Rodriguez. He's uh, uh, still a high school coach in Miami. Uh, it just, uh, it's unbelievable. He, he 
you know, his, his love for helping young people through the game of basketball, he just can't get away from it. And, uh, but he was, uh, you know, from our neighborhood and, uh, you know, basketball wasn't popular in the, in the Cuban community, uh, back in the 1970s. And, uh, uh, he, he taught us, uh, to play basketball when we were all 12, 13 years old. And then he, he was our junior varsity high school basketball coach. And then he eventually he became the head coach at the high school and, um, and, uh, uh, you know, everything I've learned from organizing a practice schedule to, uh, to, to the expectations, I tell people all the time, you know, Anthony was our best player. Um, and shaky had that, uh, that, that, that we can line up and figure out a way to beat the Lakers if they came through the door. Uh, and, and, you know, we're a bunch of kids that couldn't play. We, we, we loved the game and we play, worked at it, but we, we were no good as players. Anthony was good. The rest of us weren't. Um, uh, but, but in our minds, uh, he convinced us that, uh, that we were good enough to, to go out and play against the Lakers. And, um, but it's, it's by far him to this day. Uh, he's, uh, he's a guy that, uh, that I'm going to pick up the phone and call and, and throw things at uh, just to help me think through some of my decisions uh, but my, my whole passion, uh, you know, we're all coaches, man. And, and you love when you put something in practice and you actually go and you watch it run in practice. And it looks pretty good. And then you run in a game and it works and you're sitting there and you're saying, holy crap, I did something. actually <laughs> help the team do something right, you know. Uh, but at the end of the day, the, the, the joy we all gain is the same joy that that's provided us. Uh, which is we've all become better because of the game. We've all met people and grown in our lives and our relationships and all because of the game. And uh, uh, when I see young people go through that journey, uh, that, that's what brings me the ultimate joy. And I learned all that from him. You talk about expectation. Expectation, try to explain that. Uh, Coach Hager, you, this, this, Miami High, is, it's a different place. I mean, the expectation of Miami High was at such a high level and the games weren't games; they were events. Try to explain a little bit of the of the pressure and the expectation. From you know, you were an assistant coach; you won state championships as a head coach there. When you took over the head coach at Miami High, what did that feel like? And what 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 was the expectation? Because I mean, it, people, I don't, I'm not sure people understand that. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's the winningest high school in the history of the state of Florida in in basketball. And uh, it's incredible. It's a, it's a community. It's the second oldest high school in the state of Florida. Uh, it's in a community that, that's, uh, um, that, that's been always so represented because it, it, it's, so, it's like everything else. It was the closest high school to downtown Miami. So, so what happens? You know, cities grow not from the outside into downtown. They grow from downtown out. And so everybody forever was part of that community and everyone as it evolved. Uh, it, it, that community is what, what basically represented what that city was all about. So um, uh, there, there was an expectation to win basketball. Think about this, Seth. Uh, the, the winningest, when he, re, the gentleman named Vin Schaefer was the head coach yeah. at Miami Senior High School for 39 years. And he retired as the winningest coach in the history of the state of Florida. When Shaky Rodriguez left and Shaky was the head coach for, oof, uh, uh, for how many years? 1981 to nine, when I took over, 1995. So he was head coach for 14, 15 years. When he took over, he had the highest winning percentage of any coach in the history of the state of Florida. Uh, and then I walk in, and here comes this fool, and, and you know, and, you know, life's going to be easy. And, uh, uh, you know, we, 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 uh, we we lost to we had a 99 game home winning streak, and uh, we lost to a district uh, opponent because I benched my best three players because they didn't go to class. I got booed off the court. I mean, they I got booed off the court. That's uh, uh, then then we had a pep rally later that year where we're playing the same opponent for the district championship, and when they introduced me, they booed me off the court again, and it, it's. Uh, so, and I'm one of them. I went to school there. I lived in the community, grew up in it. It's, uh, um, but, but that's the kind of expectation that existed there. And, uh, that's, uh, um, it, I, I want to say it prepared me to deal with the college expectations where, uh, you know, everyone thinks you got to win every day. And I just, I just sit back and don't get wrapped up with that stuff. 
All right, before I ask Dave about expectation, people would want to know, all right, Shaky, how did he get his name? His nickname. Because that's all I to be honest with you, that's all I knew him by is I mean, when I used to go to practices down there, and you'll get into that story later, but I mean, like his practices are incredible. But is there is there a story behind his nickname? Yeah, when he was a kid in high school there at Miami Senior, he couldn't sit still. He was always bouncing up and off the walls. Uh, uh, couldn't couldn't sit still. Coach Schaefer would be trying to teach a drill, and he'd be jumping up and down on the side. He just uh, so they they nicknamed the JV coach at the time, who you also know, Seth Bob Kaufman. Oh yeah, uh, nick, crazy nickname. Yeah, nicknamed him Shaky. He said, "You just can't sit still. You're gonna you're shake from now on. You're Shaky, and that's been his nickname since." That's unbelievable. Coach Hager, expectation, like, you know, when you're coaching in the IBA, the CBA, the G League, whatever it is, and then, you know, you get an NBA job, day to day, what is that pressure like? Oh, Mercy, it's a, uh, it's, it's stressful. That's, there's no doubt about that, but then, you know, these positions are, I just think, you know, when I look at uh, what coach Martin's talking about, when you get to a level of those expectations behind that, you have built tradition. And I think, you know, for how many coaches uh, don't last more than two or three or four years in an NBA setting, uh, that to me is a beautiful, beautiful thing, whether it be high school college, or sometimes even in high uh, school, it does happen if you stay there long enough. And, and I think when we look at the, the Memphis Grizzlies that I got to be a part of and grew up uh, as an assistant coach uh, through that team and watched Mike Conley, OJ Mayo, Rudy Gay, Mark Gasol, added Zach Randolph, added Tony Allen. And we were able to do that for, you know, a level of eight, nine years together. That's as close as you can kind of come in the pros uh, to having a high expectation, setting a tradition. Guys go through there. This is what it's like to put on this uniform and to play in this arena for these fans. I think uh, I certainly felt a lot of pressure uh, when I became the head coach of the Grizzlies because we were just coming off the Western Conference Finals. And so there's an idea that, hey, you know, it's always going to get better and better and better. And, and we struggle a little bit out of the gate the next year. And, and you know, personally that uh, you you bear the brunt of that. But uh, I think the flip side of it is, is having those expectations and building a tradition. Uh, the pressure is there, but uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing if you can get it done. All right. I got to ask you then, what's the best nickname any player of yours had? Because I, I can tell you what my nickname was for my college coach, but we couldn't do it because it, it started with a, S and ended with an H. There's a oven in the middle of it, and it was little blank, blank, blank. Well, what's it? Oh man, you got it. You, you have you have uh, some. I think uh, CBA had to have some great characters. Oh man, yeah, yeah. There's uh, there, there's a lot of a lot of bus rides and a, a lot of time spent together, uh, fostering relationships, and uh, and all you ever want to do is to see those guys uh, get their chance in the NBA and, and move up and move on. But, you know, I had Marcus Cousins uh, in Sacramento. I love Boogie. I think that's still a classic uh, nickname for me and the guy that I, I have a lot of love for. Hey, Frank, you're, you're, you're right now chair of the NABC's Committee on Racial Injustice. Yep. What, what is, what's the goal of that committee right now? And, uh, you know, as you're starting to move forward and, and how are you trying to put together that committee to try to have some type of impact and change? Uh, you know, Seth, uh, uh, it's it, it's such a broad subject that just, uh, you know, doing it just to say, you know, blah, 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 right. uh, doesn't make any sense. And I, you know me, Seth, I'm not, uh, let's just put stuff up, up on the board to make it sound good. I, I wouldn't be a part of that if that's what I thought we were trying to do. Uh, but we're trying to identify um, uh, certain avenues where in, in our walk of life, uh, through basketball, uh, education, um, that we can impact um, uh, the, 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 the things that are in place uh, that maybe don't make it a fair fight sometimes. And uh, like I, I have a, a little saying, and it's just my life and what I've learned. Uh, some people in this country run the 100 yard dash. Other people run the 100 t the 110 yard hurdles. Um, and, you know, I was one of those that ran the hurdles. Uh, nobody ever told me, no, you can't do it. They just said you better deal with the obstacles that are in place. And the objective is to get to the finish line. And, um, uh, you know, in an education, we have some hurdles that are put in place 
uh, for for people that come from Miami Senior High School, you know, from people that come from the inner city schools around the country, and that's because of education. And uh, and, and what I have always I'm of the opinion. I'm not saying the NABC has this opinion. This is my opinion, and I've been sharing it with them. Uh, education in this country is the great equalizer. Um, you know, we're all looking for access and opportunity and education. Getting on a college campus uh, gives us all uh, access and opportunities uh, so we can move forward in life. So um, I, I think that's a big, big part of what we're trying to do is, uh, you know, uh, it's to, to find uh, uh, a place in our world, uh, meaning basketball, uh, that, that falls under our umbrella, uh, things that we can do. Uh, to change some of the things that are in place uh, that prevent uh, people uh, that come from certain places that look a certain way, um, uh, having the opportunities to be able to have access and opportunity uh, to move forward in life. And uh, so we're in the process of putting all those thoughts together. Uh, uh, we got some, some unbelievable amount of coaches that have caught. I mean, it's blown my mind how many guys have been willing to, to be a part of it. Uh, and uh, black, white—I'd uh, say black, white, and Hispanic. But heck, there's only like three of us in the whole industry. So it's—and uh, I'm big enough to represent three guys on my own. So I guess I. <laughs> uh, but uh, it's—it's—it's it's, uh, uh, it, been powerful for me uh, engaging in conversations uh, with so many, so many guys in my in our field uh, that are so open uh, to to what what can we do to make things better. And, and so willing to listen. And, and, and here's the other part, having guys like Conzo Martin, Anthony Grant, Tommy Amaker uh, share with us their journey and to, to allow all of us to understand things even better. Um, that, uh, that, you know, but I think it's, I think it's going to be a great thing. Um, you know, it, you know, Seth, you, we all remember back in the eighties, you know, John Thompson, George Raveling, John Chaney, Nolan Richardson, they took a stance against Proposition 48. And, and, and they all walked out of a game. And, and one of the most powerful moments from that, that experience was when Dean Smith came out and said, uh, if they walk out next game, I'm walking out too. And, and that unity that it showed that it wasn't just uh, the coaches of color standing up for certain kind of legislation, but it was also Dean Smith uh, that joined them. Uh, you know, created change and created change in a way that, you know, what we all, you know, Seth, in this business, it's crazy because everyone wants to talk about how much money the coaches make and the players don't make any money. It's the only two things they want to talk about. Uh, but let's talk about real stuff. Uh, minority college athletes, football and basketball, are graduating at a higher rate than the average college student on all our campuses. And, you know, and, and that's a lot because of the sacrifices that John Thompson and those guys made back in the 80s to because that legislation that got put in back then, which we all knew was Prop 48, that was put in to keep certain kind of people out of college. And they, they opposed it. And because of that, now there's so many more folks that come from those backgrounds that they fought to represent that are having success. Uh, because they're getting to college campuses and, and, and growing their lives. And uh, uh, so, so it's a duty. I think it's a duty of mine uh, and a duty of ours. And the more I talk to coaches, the more I realize that everyone's committed to making this happen. And we got to find our niche, man. We got to find where we can uh, make an impact uh, to continue to open doors for, for people who come from certain areas. I love what you just said, because I think some segment of, of the media – devalue education to me. There's a segment of the, of the media that doesn't understand how passionate most coaches are about their their players doing the right thing, getting a class, getting education, mm -hmm. networking, meeting people so that they could open up doors to themselves to for their futures. Because you know the reality is the league that Dave you coached in, it's a it's a it's a very, very, very elite fraternity. But you know, to me, the one thing people can't take away from you is the opportunities that you get through education and the network of people that you're experiencing while you're on campus. So I, I, I love what you're saying. Uh, Dave, what kind of conversations do you think are going on right now in t societally in, in, in NBA organizations, in locker rooms, uh, in coaching staffs 
moving forward uh, with everything that's going on with the restart, the pandemic, what's going on in our society? What what type of, you know, you've been a head coach of two different organizations. What type of just conversations are coaching staffs having, players and coaches, uh, leaders having, basically, you think within the league? Well, I think, you know, what we, what we talked about with our, our team in Sacramento was uh, – they're going to have a microphone put in front of them, each and every single one of them. And, and so let's, let's stay together first and foremost, and let's respect each other's uh, opinions because, you know, a reporter might go to one guy and ask question, then go to the next guy and go, Hey, did you know that so-and-so over here said this? And then you've got all kinds of things going back and forth that, that can be done uh, with proper conversations and just sitting down and talking. And certainly we spend a great amount of time together, airplanes, hotels, uh, locker rooms, etc. So being able to share, to listen, to learn. Uh, I do a lot of Zoom calls with college uh, uh, programs, with uh, camps and clinics and young kids. And when we talk about, you know, controlling what you can control and, and whether you don't have a place to work out or whatever. But in, in for this situation, in your own relationships, in your own your own self, how can you listen and learn and reflect? And then what kind of uh, influence can you have in those spaces that you are in and so that's for some people that's their family that's maybe their job we have these platforms uh to be able to affect greater change and so i think that's uh just talking to your team about those things and and for me it's i do the least amount of talking uh, I do the most or try to do the most amount of listening and understanding. And then how do we take that discussion and move towards uh, some kind of action? Frank, what kind of conversations are you have with your guys like right now? Uh, are they on campus? And, and, and what's what's the feedback you're getting from them? What's the feeling that they're going through? Because they like, let's face it. I mean, they went from the pandemic to obviously the tragedy that's going on in our society. I mean, you know, we talk about 18, we, we keep on forgetting. These are 18 and 19 and 20 year olds. Uh, and they've got emotions, they've got voids, they've got feelings uh, that are, you know, really, really strong. So how, what kind of conversations you have with your guys? Encourage them to express themselves. Uh, it's, uh, I got, I, I, I've, I've been, I've had these conversations with our team, Seth, since I started coaching uh, cause, cause of where I come from. I just, uh, there's different things. And, uh, and, uh, uh, but I, my whole thing is, um, we, we, some of us need to listen. I tend to listen a lot more because you learn from your players so much when you can get them to express themselves. And then what I spend a lot of time speaking to them about is like, don't be scared to express yourself. But the only thing you have to do is Whenever you get that, Dave just spoke about that microphone. You're going to get a microphone in your face. You got to make sure you represent your your point, what you're trying to express, that you represent it in an intelligent way, so it so people actually uh, embrace it and pay more attention and are inquired to grow the thought even more. Uh, so you know, anyone can take a microphone and make a bunch of noise, and it's going to be treated as noise. But if you can figure out a way to represent that noise. In a, in a way that that attracts people's ears, then you've made music. And when you make music, everybody wants to listen to it. And and and, and it's it's uh, I think it's an important way of uh, uh, of of having those conversations with our players. Is number one, be comfortable having. I'm in your corner. I'm here to help you. I'm here to fight for your wishes, and and fight for your needs. Uh, so so be comfortable and tell me whatever it is that you have to say. Then let me help you. Uh, understand how to express your points. So then, you know, because our country, whether we like it or not, and sometimes we do it to ourselves, you know, we all get put in a box and we're supposed to exist in that box that we get put in. You're a basketball player, get in the box. You're black, get put in the box. You're a Cuban, get put in the box. And anytime you step outside of that box that we get put in, uh, the people that are don't live in your box, uh, their antennas go up. It's like, well, why is this guy over here talking about something that he's not a part of? Um, and what we have to do now is the ones that are outside that box have to listen. And the ones that step outside the box to speak, uh, we have to be like, to your point, what are we going to represent uh, with that organization that we're creating within the NABC? 
Uh, we, we have to be very intelligent in how we represent the things that we're not comfortable with so we can get everyone to listen as if they were listening to music and, and be more open to understanding the lyrics so then we can all enjoy it together. Yeah, and you, know, you talk about support system, which obviously you're creating a support system for them to have expression. Coach Hager, like the NBA is getting younger and younger and younger. What type of support systems does the NBA have in place to support? Because the NBA, a third of your roster could be the same age as Frank's roster. Well, that's what I was thinking when you were saying how Frank's got 18, 19, and 20-year-old kids. That's what we had at Sacramento, man. It was first and second year young guys. And uh, it, it is a beautiful thing, the energy that they have. And uh, it, it is fun to coach a young team. Uh, but just to, to sit down and, and watch them grow from the time that you get to work with them until your time is no more. Uh, and to obviously coach, you've been doing this longer than I have, but I've been in it 25 years now. Uh, and to, to see guys that you coached 25 years ago and how their lives have, have turned out is, is, is quite a, quite a neat deal. But as far as how the league is set up and uh, I think perhaps there's better communication now than there has ever been uh, about helping guys uh, fulfill what it is that they are passionate about in all kinds of different areas. And so uh, I certainly, I think the leadership is excellent with Adam Silver um, and, and maybe one of the best commissioners of all time uh, dealing with social issues of sport and our country. And so I think uh, very embracing. Uh, and then we, I think we have good older players in our league that uh, I think they're positive uh, and they're more vocal than have ever been. And being able to have those platforms, I think, is, is very positive. As Coach talked about, being able to express yourself is, is really positive. And I think uh, our league is very, very uh, at the forefront uh, of being able to do that. You know, Frank, you know, talk about young players, you know, with everything that's going on, you if you have your players on campus, I'm, I'm not sure if you do or you don't. I know the SEC has a date where the you know players are allowed to be on campus, voluntary workouts and things like. How do you move forward? How would how do you move forward with your team in terms of strength and conditioning, player development, with everything that's going on? Once that's allowed, with the climate we have in society, with obviously the pandemic. Yep. hanging over our heads. And let's face it, that thing hasn't gone away. We could be opening up states, but the pandemic is here. It's real. And until we get a vaccine or an antibody, it's not going anywhere. So how are you guys dealing with that? It's hard. Yeah, You know, Greeny, we bring players on campus to provide structure, to, to provide them with an understanding how to do things a certain way within structure because that's how you live life. You don't live life with no structure. And it's all part of that process. And uh, right now, the way it's set up, we're bringing them back so they can do voluntary workouts with a strength coach. So that means that they can, they, they're they going to live in this imaginary bubble and they get to train with the strength coach four times a week, one hour per session. So what are they doing the other 23 hours of the day? Because we're not allowed to be around them. We're not allowed to provide any structure. They're not taking classes. Uh, there, there's no basketball. Uh, so bringing them back right now, in my opinion, is not helping them, it, other than just saying that they're living on campus. So uh, we haven't brought our guys back. Uh, there's a big vote that goes on um, uh, next week, uh, excuse me, on Wednesday, um, and uh, to determine what date in July we can start doing more workouts and actually be like we're structuring their lives as they used to be structured in the summer. Uh, so once once that legislation uh, is passed on Wednesday and we figure out that exact date, that's when we'll be bringing our guys back. But it, but it's hard because you got to do everything uh, like we're doing it right now uh, on Zoom calls with the team, one-on-one uh, -on -one FaceTimes, uh, and then just nonstop communication. And, um, you know, and uh, they, they, they're, they're resourceful, uh, but – then again, you know, it's uh, uh, basketball is not a sport that everyone had a goal in their driveway. It's a, you know, not everyone had that. Basketball is a sport that we all kind of shared a goal. And we all went to that guy's house with the goal in the driveway. Or we all went to the park and, and figured out a way to stay on the court and not get thrown out of the park. And 
Um, and right now they, they don't have access to those things. So uh, they've had to improvise. And so one thing I've tried to tell our team the whole time is that we're all in the same boat. It's not like uh, same umbrella, excuse me. Um, it's not like some schools got more advantages than we do. We're all in the same situation. So it's what we all do on our own uh, and what kind of ownership we take individually uh, to try and figure out a way to work uh, that will eventually allow us uh, to bridge that gap once we all come back together here in the near future. See, the other thing that people don't realize is, is so how hard it is on some families, because a lot of these guys, their quality of life on campus is absolutely terrific. Uh, you know, all of a sudden you have a, you know, a sophomore or junior going back home. It's another mouth to feed for mom and dad or just mom or just dad. Uh, it, you know, there's a greater pressures uh, because of, let's face it, there are 40 million people unemployed. I mean, I, I, who knows if you have a parent that's in, that, that right now, you know, unemployed, which is impacting the quality of life for the, for the people in their household. So, yeah, that's Cody. I, mean, I wanted to ask too, I, is Coach Frank, are you dealing with this each on an individual basis? Because every, every dude's situation is maybe that house needs his support. Or maybe that's not a great place and the, the campus is better. So each situation is different, perhaps. Yes, absolutely. We've got a we got one of our guys that it's seven in a two bedroom, seven people in a two bedroom. And they've been shacked in there for two and a half months. Right. And uh, we're probably going to bring him back uh, before we bring everybody else back. And and it's just because of uh, the, the, the fact that he's in a uh, great family, but. It's hard to be trapped right. indoors in a two bedroom when there's seven of you. And, yeah. uh, you know, and uh, so we're probably going to bring him back. And, and that's, you know, my boss has been great about that. But, the, but here comes the challenge. So now he's going to be back here by himself. Huh. And, you know, Dave, you know, what happens to 20 year olds? We were all 20 once upon we a time. We just stayed in our room, coach. We just we're stayed in our room. room. It's, 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 uh, you know, and, and, and you, we might do it for a couple of days, but eventually we're going to say, well, I'm going to find out where somebody's playing here in town. I'm going to go show up there right. and I'm going to find out where everyone else that's my age is. Cause I think we've all seen the part, the pictures of, you know, social uh, people socializing. Um, let me go find out. Cause I'm not going to be here by myself. And it, 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 yeah. it creates, yeah. and then Dave, Seth, I think we all remember if they get in trouble in our city, who's getting blamed. Right there. Yep. You know, so it's, it, you know, it's, uh, which I'm okay with. They're going to be a kid as long as they don't harm anybody. I'm okay with them trying to learn how to live life. Uh, but, but yes, to your point, it's very individualized. It, it, it's not a team thing. It's very individualized. Yeah. Dave, NBA coming back, whether they play or not, but like guys are back in practice facilities. So moving forward, uh, you know, if a team is going to eventually go to Orlando, if that does happen. What, what, what interaction, like, what, what are guys doing with their teams? And how long do you think it takes, I mean, how long will it take for guys to get up to speed if they have to play games? Oh, good. Uh, I don't think it's going to take four weeks I, or, you know, is there, a, is it 10 days or, or whatnot? I think I'm just really, really excited uh, about returning to play. I think you're going to see guys have, they're going to be fresh. They're going to be healed. And yes, timing could be off. Uh, conditioning at the high, high level uh, could be uh, behind a little bit. And so there is uh, perhaps uh, increased risk of injury uh, in those cases. But by and large, I think uh, what we're going to see is just it's just going to be tremendous. Uh, I wish I was a part of it, certainly, uh, because, you know, as a coach, you know, get sequestered and it's just all hoop all day until from start until they say it's over or you, you lose out in the playoffs or whatnot in this. And uh, I'm really excited for it to get back to to playing. Frank, how did how did your what your women's team could have won national championship this year? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they were they were ridiculous. I mean, you know how how is Don South? She's an amazing amazing coach and and it's done an incredible job. You know how 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 have those kids dealt with it and how how is the coaching staff kind of sued them through? The disappointment because you know you don't have a chance at well maybe they do but most times you don't have a chance every year you know how, yeah. how's that that experience been yeah it's uh you know greeny I, I my heart went out for them uh because i i see them every day i know how they practice i know how they they you know we, we share a facility so i know what they're like in the weight room i 
Uh, I know the, 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 the quality of people there. Don and I have become friends. Uh, so I, I know uh, how much she cares and how driven she is. And, um, you know, and uh, uh, at the time, uh, I wasn't worried about that because we were right in the proverbial bubble. Uh, so we were a team that was good enough that if we get into the conference tournament and, and you win a couple games, you're right back in this thing. And uh, so I was more concerned with my guys. Uh, and, and, and helping my guys uh, understand. Because as competitors, I think we all – all we're ever looking for is a chance to play another game. If we got a chance to play another game, we're good. Let's go. And, um, and we, 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 we weren't afforded that opportunity. Uh, but once I, I separated from my team, I started to realize, like, they had beaten everyone in the country. And they, they, they were undisputed number one team in the country, uh, undefeated in conference play, won the conference tournament. Uh, and – um, and, and, you know, you, you, your team is that good. Uh, you want to have, you, you don't want, you don't, I don't, I, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, I, I don't want people to say, I think they were the best team. I want to be able to say, no, we won. We were the best team. And, um, and when you're not given the opportunity to play and prove that, I think it's disheartening. I think Dawn handled it like a champ. I mean, uh, she, she kept her, her player spirits up. I think it's one of the reasons you've seen Dawn, uh, so so aggressive vocally publicly uh, with that topic is that uh, uh, she's doing it to, to to keep her her ladies strong and 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 let them let let them know how much she believed in them herself. I guess like to finish up, Coach Yeager, like moving forward right now, just in basketball, what 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 in a perfect world, what happens? We play an NBA, finish the NBA season. What do you think the timetable is to reboot? Like there's a lot of conversation about, uh, you know, is there going to be a combine? Is there, are the teams that are, aren't playing in the, in the playoffs going to play? Uh, you know, for college guys, I mean, there, there is, I think if I'm not mistaken, there's 225 or 35 guys, underclassmen right now, who put their names in the draft. Now, you got to understand now. Uh, over the last few years, I, actually, there was a study done the other day that uh, of the number of guys that have put their names in the draft uh, early, like it is absolutely minuscule. The, the hundred, I think, one hundred sixty-seven guys a year ago put their names in the draft didn't get drafted. So, like, moving forward, where do you see the, the timetable for the NBA going? For whether it's finishing the season, the combine, the draft. A lottery, the draft, starting up, starting ball up again. Yeah, it, it seems like there's more questions than there is answers. Uh, and you, once you make one decision, then it you have other consequences of making that, and how do you get it back all together? So uh, it, it'll be interesting to see. Uh, first of all, who is going to be allowed in the bubble? So if your your management, X number of people from your management aren't going to be uh, in the bubble and can be working at the office, then maybe we can do the draft a little bit sooner. Uh, to expedite and to, you know, get that process going because it appears there could be a very short turnaround from the end of the NBA finals of 2020 to the beginning of the season for 2020, 21. And so that's a very condensed uh, timeline. Uh, here we are sitting here still, it's still June and, and uh, you know, there's not a lot of answers uh, and a lot, a lot of questions, but uh, I, I think we got great leadership in the league and, and we're going to figure it out the best we can. And uh, it'll be interesting to see. Frank, like I just saw the thing with Ohio State, they were asking players to sign waivers. Uh, yet we know kids are out playing ball and they're working out on their own. Mm -hmm. what, what, what's your what's your gut feeling on, you know, depending, obviously everything depends on if there's a spike. What's your gut feeling on students returning to campus and eventually, not normal, because until we have a vaccine, we won't have anything normal. But basketball being played and and I'm sure there are protocols that are being talked about to have in place in case someone does test positive what what just what's in your heart of heart what you got feeling over the next three or four months then on um, where we're going with the start of your season or players coming back yeah I you know Greeny I think there's so much unknown uh I, I think that there's some very intelligent people that have put in an unbelievable amount of time to figure out the safest route. Um, but we're not dealing with, uh, you know, it's like when we play a team that's in a matchup zone and we don't attack it the right way, 
Okay, so we go back and we prepare and we do things differently. And the next time you play, you might still not attack it the right way, but at least you're better prepared for that matchup zone. Well, we're we're dealing with a zone that no one's seen before, and uh, uh, so so uh, uh, I think there's going to be a lot of reactionary decisions uh, that are going to have to take place, and um, there's a lot of uh, plan Bs because we all got a plan B, uh, but there's going to have to be a lot of plan Cs because we really don't know what's going to happen. I I know all college campuses are excited about opening up the campuses and and getting the students back over here. I know ours is. Uh, it'll be interesting once uh, we get to that place in the middle of August sometime. Um, and, and the athletes is, uh, you know, how are we going to play? How are we going to practice? Uh, um, you know, I, I told someone the other day, I'm, I'm like, there's only so much social distancing you can practice in football and basketball now. It's uh, eventually you're going to have to collide and land on top of people and and knock somebody and, you know, and sweat on top. It's just going to happen. And uh, so eventually we're going to have to turn the reins loose and let them go and and just uh, and see what happens and and, and kind of cross our fingers, for lack of better words. But uh, uh, I just know this, Greeny, the people that are trying to make those decisions or if uh, Coach Yeager was uh, uh, locked in a bubble with a bunch of 18 and 19-year-olds, uh, his hair would look a lot like yours and mine, a lot. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, you know, it, it's it's one of those deals. And I, I, don't, I don't think there's an answer. Outside of trying to do what the NBA is doing, which is hunker down and lock everything up and kind of control everyone's life uh, for the better part of three months and isolate yourself, I don't think there's a, a, an answer as to uh, what plan A and B are. I think we, we better have plan C, D, and E prepared. And some of those, hey, some of those will be no different than some of our timeouts. Hey, scrap everything. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's interesting. I, 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 you want, I, I'm not a race car fan, but you know, you see those masks the race car guys wear underneath their helmets that basically cover them. I got to believe some sporting good company is creating something that is like start with football, a shield and face coverings that would fit right into a helmet to maybe mitigate a little bit of the opportunity to have that type of, of interaction, you know, but it is, it, we're, we're, we're walking around in a big question mark. Uh, and I think the biggest thing is, and I appreciate both of you guys taking the time is that people care and uh, people and, and the biggest thing, having these conversations, whether it is bringing kids back to campus, having these conversations that are comfortable about what's going on in society, having these conversations about how we can make a difference, uh, having confidence in our young people that are not afraid to stand up with, for what, what's right, all those things. The more we can have these conversations, the more we can hear different opinions, the more we can listen, the more we can have humanity and respect and compassion, the better chance we all have to get through not only the pandemic, but everything else that's going on in the world. And, uh, I just I really appreciate that you guys would take the time and visit and and, and share your thoughts and uh, and I'm happy Frank because I thought you were going to throw Perry the Wonder Dog coming to practice at Miami High and you showed great great discipline because when I was just a young assistant at Miami University of Miami and Frank was an assistant at Miami High I just got this dog I was driving around I said oh yeah Shaky's practicing I'm going to go over and watch Shaky. I didn't even think twice. The dog was sitting there. We watched three hours of practice. It was hot as hell in that gym. It was great. Frank walks over to me. He is killing me. Killing me. <laughs> the dog was fine. We just wanted to take a watch. Just like today. We just wanted to watch a little hoop. You yes. know what I mean? Like, we just want to have a chance to talk a little hoop and have a little normalcy in our lives. Hey, Greeny, here's, here's the one good thing that's going to come about this whole coronavirus thing. Hopefully, we find a cure real fast. But I'm going to coach with one of those masks on for the rest of my career. It's been my biggest saving grace to my coaching career is wearing one of those masks. Oh, I'll tell you one thing. We start up play and there's 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 no fans in the stands. I know one thing. At your home games, you're pumping in crowd noise. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you're the best, man. Take care of your family. I appreciate it. Appreciate you guys. Great seeing you, Seth, Dave, both of you guys. Thanks, Coach. Thanks, man.